when we're talking about global multinational organizations with with offices around the globe or uh, manufacturing sites ac across the globe, I think one key foundational piece is to have more of a centralized control of your uh, digital uh, digital team, right? Uh, instead of having too much of a decentralized kind of uh, IT or, or ERP teams across uh, across different sites, it, it needs to be you, it needs to be centralized. I, I I believe so. So one of the companies that I worked in, they had the, uh, a large business analyst, uh, ERP business analyst team in in their head office, and whether they would uh, roll out the, uh, a system. Uh, in another in another site in another country, or is it uh, because of a, of a of a mergers and acquisition activity? So they have to they have to roll out their system in that in that other entity. It always was done from a, a, a centralized uh, ERP uh, ERP team, because uh, and then from there, when you have that, then your master data is also run by a centralized group, right? So uh, consistency of data, um, uh, the data sets that are, that are, that are being uh, deployed, uh, the attributes that are being deployed, the data structures are all consistent across, across the, the global company. And thirdly, once you have consistent data, you can have consistent uh, planning processes running, running through it. So uh, you can have, let's say, the uh, the mother, the, the the mother office or the central office, the central planning office can run SNOP at a global level, right? And then you could have regional planning office that would take that SNOP output and then uh, drive the the master production scheduling, and then you had more on the site level that could drive MRP and shop floor control. Um, and then the regional, you can either do it at the site. Uh, you, uh, I mean, uh, distribution plan, you could either do it at the site or at the regional level, depending on what you'd like to do. So, so looking at those planning levels, you could achieve those planning levels even for complex and global organizations if your data uh, system, basically, your, is, is, uh, is being, uh, there's some oversight, uh, no, there's oversight from from a central point of view, mm. yeah, and it's interesting hearing you say that. I agree with everything you just said. I think that centralization and, and having that consistency of processes and um, focus on data management, things like that, everything you just described is is very important, especially for larger, more complex multinational organizations. However, it it also runs counter to some of the conventional wisdom or, or some of the emerging thinking in the market, which is we should do more agile these sorts of implementations. We should be more decentralized. We should have flat organizations. And, you know, so there's some sort of business trends or uh, movements, the opposite direction of what you're, you're describing. How do you, how do you reconcile that? I mean, do you see that sort of a conflict between conventional thinking or, or emerging thinking and how things should be versus the way things actually work and are most effective or what are your thoughts? Uh, my, I, I sort of, uh, how can I say, put aside that kind of uh, those, those buzzwords in terms of how to deploy technology like, like Agile or, or Lean or, uh, or, or whatnot. Uh, you know what? I just first is set up your design and <laughs> your design needs to be clear end to end. And it's not about just having a, a overall to be process design, but it's looking at the actual data sets that sit under those processes, sit under those activities, making sure your data set is standardized, is robust, meaning it's robust. It can meet all the, all the possible business scenarios that your company has to go through, whether it's uh, selling an item, uh, the different type of sales uh, scenarios that can go through, whether uh, the different, uh, making sure it goes through the, the let's say the, 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 the supply chain. So, so, uh, so all the scenarios, so you have to cover all of that and that has to be put on paper first. 
uh, and you have to cover the whole the whole gamut of, of of business scenarios and making sure your data structure can support that. And if it cannot support that, then you revise your data structure. You have to add, uh, you know, a, a field because you you have to meet a certain scenario. So that's how you have to build it. And uh, from my experience, if you don't do that that readiness, right, uh, you're not going to get the full functionality of the system. Because if you don't know, if you don't, if you didn't lay out all the all the scenarios and the data sets that support it, then you cannot connect the dots in terms of how you can build automation through the solution. Because you don't have your data set isn't robust enough to do so. Right. Yeah, that's well said. And I think you use the word setting aside buzzwords and trends. I think that's a really important point because. Yeah. You know, there's there's certain trends and buzzwords that may apply to you as an organization, and there's many that won't. And so you have to really see past that in your business and what you're trying to accomplish. I, I look at the, the the agile kind of uh, way of doing things. That could work if you're if you're developing apps, right? Uh, right. You know, you you you're, you're developing certain programs, but. In our case, we're not developing programs for the sake of of, of ease of messaging or 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 or, or, or shopping or, or or whatever. It's actually we have to run an organization, so you have to know right. your organization's requirements uh, right. before. So you can't really go agile unless you have defined all your organization's requirements, uh, or else uh, uh, what can happen is actually the new system that's coming in might be even worse than the than the system that the that the organization currently has, <laughs> and then, right. and and therefore you where's your value after that? So uh, yeah, the agile I'm not I'm not a big fan. <laughs> uh, you and I share that uh, common uh, <laughs> that commonality for sure, among other things. Uh, but I'd be curious to hear from the audience what do you think of agile, especially in complex uh, multinational complex organizations? Do you think agile has a role? Do you think it's a, is it overrated? Is it something that has practical use? I'd love to hear the audience comments here too, as, as we're chatting through it. And that's usually a, a, uh, a controversial topic. So I like to ask it whenever yeah. we can. So I'd love to hear the audience's thoughts here too. And so, so another thing that you and I share um, in addition to our skepticism of agile Dean is that there's also, we also have a, I'd say we both have a shared skepticism for general tech trends and, you know, general, you mentioned buzzwords, but just talking about technical trends and, and tell me a little bit about your thoughts of um, trends in the marketplace in terms of technology trends and, and sort of how it fits into the realities of what organizations should be doing in their digital transformation. Well, in order to, uh, to become more optimal in how to, uh, plan and 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 manage a business. Um, I don't think adding new trendy technology is the is is, is the way to go. Uh, it's about in order to for for technology to to work because technology is only good if it works, right? So you have to look internally in the organization. Where is the organization at in terms of their digital mindset? Uh, uh, and is that in, is that digital mindset available across across um, across the the company top down, right? And and I what I focus on is is enabling that digital mindset uh, in the organization. So so uh, can companies or anyone in or, or key people in the organization can they take a a process that the company is, is currently, uh, you know, uh, using or, or, or uh, you know, it's part of their, if part of their working process, can they translate that on pen and paper in terms of data structure and data flow? If the majority, if the company can achieve that, then we're able to implement new technologies first of all because if it doesn't work on pen and paper uh and 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 it's not uh robust enough and it doesn't meet the end-to-end -end process then you have a problem because it won't work 
it won't work when you when you're when you're implementing a solution or uh, uh, yeah a, a program. Um, so and and when we're talking about agile and, and all that earlier, how I how I approach implementing a solution is really it's like I, I take an engineering point of view. It's like building a bridge, right? You're not gonna you're not gonna go on and and agilely build a bridge, right? You gotta you gotta build your blueprint. You gotta make sure your blueprint meets all the all the environmental conditions. You have to you have to do uh, force testing across every 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 part of the bridge. Make sure it can support uh, the load that, that 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 that's required. And to do that, you gotta do that on pen and paper first, uh, and, and 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 get agreement across the organization that that's the best way to go. And um, and that's uh, and that's part of the readiness. Piece that we often do with our with our clients before they actually uh, invite or ask the solution integrator to come in and and start uh, rolling out the solution. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, you look at, you know, you mentioned, for example, that you you've you've been implementing technology for a long time. You talked about JD Edwards, and you know, you've seen the evolution of technology over the years and and some of the changes in technology. And I think that. You know, it's interesting is how how fast technology changes and how much uh, growth has happened in the technology space. But at the same time, organizations and their ability to change hasn't really kept up. So, in other yeah. words, you have a company, if you're a company that you have enough trouble just implementing a basic GL system or a basic inventory management system, it's not going to do you any good to now try to pile on a bunch of other new technologies on top of that when you can't even get the basic fundamentals implemented well. Um, yeah. So it's it's sort of like you have to learn to walk before you run with with a lot of these tech trends. Yeah, it's like uh, it's like playing any other sp- any sport, right? Uh, let's take uh, tennis for example. Uh, the the new system or the new technology could be a new racket, right? Or mm-hmm. another uh, another bolt on that you like to add or another add on. Those are those are your your tennis shoes. But if the player isn't ready to for the match and he's he's not uh, he's not in good shape. His his um, his footwork is weak. His technique is weak. His serve is weak. You know, uh, um, what's the point? <laughs> what's right. the point in, in in buying in buying all, all all that equipment if you can't use it? And that's 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 really the analogy that I have with with technology and organization is is focus on the player, right? Focus on the player. Is are are you are you, do you have the right fitness level? Do you have the right technique? Do you have, do you have the right mentality to play a to play a, a tennis match and and to go through the grind and all that? Uh, we focus on that, and then once the player is is strong enough, regardless of what technology you choose, the player will adapt to it. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, great, great analogy. If if I buy if I buy racket brand A or racket brand B, but I you know I'm I'm a solid tennis player, I'll still do well on the tennis court. Right. No, that's a, that's a great point. And, you know, the focus becomes on becoming a great tennis player versus, you know, which racket am I going to use or which ball do I prefer and that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So here's a, here's an interesting question from um, Irina on um, YouTube. And the question that Irina has is, how do you build teams for a new ERP implementation? So you, you've been involved with a lot of our clients and helping them do this and helping them through the implementations. But how do you, what advice do you give to an organization that's trying to build their internal digital mindset, as you mentioned before, but also, you know, what is the, how do they structure that team or what are some tips to, to structure that team to, to help them through the transformation? Um, if I had to choose one role that I feel it's critical in order for organizations to really take ownership and to, uh, uh, how to say to be in control of their of their digital transformation journey is the role of a business analyst, internal mm-hmm. business analyst, not outside business analysts like consultants coming in, but organizations, who, uh, business analysts who, number one, um, they need to understand um, business management uh, best practices, right? Because best practices is it, for me it's it's a good starting point because already that sets the right foundation in terms of what 
information you require in order to run the process or how information should be structured. Uh, take, for example, like in the manufacturing organization, we talk a lot about bill of materials, MRP, uh, inventory. So in that, that's to achieve MRP. So those best practices of having inf- uh, proper inventory control and, and, and um, adequate bill of materials, those are certain best practices that needs to f- that, that, that uh, the business analyst should, should know about, first of all. And then the business analysts should have a should be able to design really uh, new processes, right? Um, uh, improve uh, to be processes and also design uh, um, data structures. Improve your data structure to meet those business process uh, to meet those those different business processes. So uh, because they're the ones. Uh, who who are the ones who are going to connect between, let's say, your system integrator and the organization, and because during the implementation, you don't you want to, of course, uh, you know, the the employees in the organizations they will be involved, they'll have key roles as super users or or process leads and whatnot, uh, but you don't want to take too much of their time. Let the business analysts take the load. In the implementation to be the facilitator between between uh, the business members and 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 the consultants, um, and that and the business analyst will be the one during implementation who would who would develop the uh, the processes. So you so you're not wasting uh, so you're not spending too much money for the SIs to do that. Number one, number two is uh, for all the data cleansing, uh, the testing. Uh, and, and, and then troubleshooting, you have, those, you have that layer of business analysts to, uh, to support the business team. Right. Yeah, that's, that's good advice. And it's, it's a good way to think about building these competencies internally. You know, you, you certainly want to leverage outside consulting help and that outside experience that you don't have, but you also don't want to be so dependent on outside consultants that you sort of create that learned helplessness. You want to be able to start to build that competency in-house that you can own this longer term. Right. And, and, and one, and they will get the, the, the full on uh, knowledge transfer from the SIs on, on the actual uh, back end of, 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 of the solution. So if, if, if we are to improve certain configurations that that's required in the system, or actually build certain customization because uh, uh, you know for certain areas, or to to build APIs and connect other other solutions, they will have that they have that knowledge to do so. So you don't need to always ask for outside consultants to do that work. So you've you've built that that internal capable team to support the business moving uh, moving forward. Right. Yeah. Makes, makes total sense. Um, here's an interesting comment from Megan on LinkedIn. Megan says, as a new digital transformation consultant, these analogies and examples are so helpful. So I'm glad um, this this is helping you, Megan, and hopefully it's helping other, other people uh, listening in as well. Um, here's an interesting question from uh, Ryan on LinkedIn. I'll see if I can show the entire comment. It'll hide our faces for a moment, but we can see it here. Uh, Ryan says, how do you resolve issues where the executive team is forcing a system that may not be the right fit for a company, especially when the rest of the company sees the issues and voices their concern ahead of time. And maybe I'll broaden that question a little bit to say, you know, what are some tips you would have for companies to overcome resistance to change in general, whether it's because they don't like the new system that's being deployed, or maybe there's just certain parts of it they don't like, or challenges they see in the changes that are going to be driven through the organization. How do you, how do you deal with that? Or what, is, what are some advice you give? Well, when we talk about the executive team, we need to uh, often we shouldn't you we shouldn't focus too much. We should articulate this this technology problem in in a way that you know the, the the executive team, the general public can can understand. And when we work with executives, and when we to choose the right solution or to change a solution. Often, at, at, well, on part of our methodology at Third Stage APAC is to uh, first is to understand what the executive's team wants out of out of their out of out of 
out of the business, what they want to do, basically, whether it's with technology or without technology, what they want to do uh, in the future. So what are their requirements, what they want to control, what do they want to manage? And then we build what we call functional architecture. And the functional architecture are basically based on their requirements. What are the what are the the, the modules and and high level functionalities that the, the the new technology should have, right? So you have that func that so the functional architecture is how you articulate uh, business requirements and and technology. It's is that is that is that middle ground. Is that is that binding point? Okay. And then from there, once, once everyone agrees on this is the functional architecture that we need, so that becomes your, uh, your shopping list, basically, right? It's, it's, it's your shopping list. I need, I need my butter. I need, I need my milk. I need my cereal. But then you go to the, then when you start looking at what's, what's available in the market, then you look at the different brands. So you have different, you can choose from different brands to meet uh, the, the, the items of your shopping list. And, um, and then you start evaluating which brand or which system, system brand is meet, best meets that functional architecture or that area of that functional architecture, that module and, and so forth. So, and then that's where you can create alignment uh, across the organization because first the organization sees, okay, we're working on the same song sheet, which is the functional architecture. Then we can start evaluating which solution is best meets that functional architecture right so it's sort of getting that the buy or the uh the input and involvement from the team in in creating that future state or that that functional architecture of what the future is going to look like and that that's one way to overcome you know to overcome that resistance and also to make sure that you choose the right system that you know best fits the organization and what the needs are yeah and the functional architecture, I, I think that's a, an extremely important exercise before actually even meeting or talking to salespeople for, for any solution because uh, that sets, again, like I was saying, that sets your shopping list and you're making sure that you're not buying too much right, or not enough. But usually oftentimes <laughs> companies buy too much and when it's time to implement, oh, we're, we weren't ready for it. We didn't, uh, or we didn't, or they question why did we, why did we buy this uh, in the first right. place, and 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 that that falls on the wayside and and it's not being into and it's not being used. Yeah, using taking your analogy one step further, your shopping list analogy. If you create your shopping list while you're starving, you haven't eaten all day. You create your shopping list, it's, you're probably going to over purchase. You're gonna be, you're uh, you're going to buy more than you need because you're just hungry, and it turns out you maybe you can't eat all that stuff that you buy and it's yeah. the same sort of thing with technology too. So, so create a shopping list that satisfies your, your needs first, right? Not just pile on or what, what would you like to have? Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly.